Hi, this is Phil McCauley for Labour Business TV. And I'm honoured today to be joined by my very special guest, Lord Victor Ardeboreli, who is a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. Uh, Victor, hi, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Phil? I'm good. Yeah. I'm pretty good, thanks. And just before we get into all of this, I mean, how have you been coping with COVID and your situation and carrying on? Uh, your pretty, pretty well. And, uh, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. I happen to be, you know, I've got a nice house. I'm, I'm um, doing this interview in, in my study. Um, I've got a job that allows me to work from home um, in a, a non-risk area. Uh, so I, I feel pretty lucky, actually. Um, I, I'm, my personal circumstances I happen to be a six-foot black guy, slightly overweight, so I'm, asking, so I'm, I'm on the wrong side of all the risk um, statistics. But my circumstances allow me to manage, manage those risks well. So I, I'm, a, I'm okay. I'm, I'm more worried about the rest of the country, to be honest. I'm glad to see that you're bucking that trend and I'm glad that you're well and yeah. you continue with your yeah. work. And before we get into uh, everything that you've been doing, uh, how did you find your way to be the co-creator of Turning Point, which has been an extraordinary success well, in terms of social well, what, what, what was your journey? How did that happen? Yeah, God, well, we haven't got the time to the detail of it, but I mean, but in a nutshell, you know, um, chance favours the prepared mind, I guess. And... Um, I've always wanted to be um, in business in some way or other, but um, and Turning Point was a business. It was a registered charity, but it was a sort of it operated as a social enterprise. Um, mm. My whole career has been involved in public services in some way, form or another. Uh, but I've always seen them as as uh, as businesses with customers and with you know bottom lines because that's the truth of the matter. They just don't have shareholders in the same way, and they have a bottom line. They have a different um, measurables uh, because they don't have shareholders. But you know, I've always seen my, I've always seen the clients of public services as as um, customers. They pay for it. You know, they they should get the best service. So that's how I got here. Um, mm -hmm. My my background is is complicated, but my parents always drilled into me a sense of public service and a sense of I'm the son of a nurse. Do you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm the son of a nurse. You know, she worked in the NHS for what forty seven years, so you know, it's in the blood. I'm afraid. I understand that, and uh, and Turning Point itself as an organisation has become really significant in terms of the provision of care and thousands of employees. Well, What's been, yeah. what's been your um, sense of the change over, over time in that organisation and the way things have developed since you left? Well, well I'm not in that organisation anymore. I'm, I'm, I can describe myself as a recovering chief exec and the, the current chief exec is <laughs> a very able woman. Um, but I guess, you know, I, when I started Turning Point, I had a turnover of about 23 million. Mm -hmm. um, we were, were losing money. We, there was a lot of... Um, there is a way that, are we a charity? There was certainly a lot of charity thinking. I think what we did, and it's not, you know, people often, you know, you did this as the chief thing, but I built a team. It was a team thing, and I built the right team, and, you know, I basked in their glory because I built the right team, basically. But yeah. we grew we grew a business that now turns over probably 140 million, employs 4,800 staff, at least it was when I left, mm -hmm. and operates in 300 locations, providing a service to 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. But... You know, what the d difference now, I mean, I left March 31st uh, uh, and COVID happened, you know, and that changed the game for everybody, including Turning Point. But what I've seen over my 20 years, uh, um, nearly 20 years as chief exec in terms of public service, public, public services in the areas that Turning Point operated, which was health, criminal justice, because we did substance misuse, um, home office, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. is it's almost it's I mean, to say but it's a cyclical thing we we sort of we have these um periods when governments recognize that there's the need to pay attention to public policy public services and then um and then that changes over time and then we go through this cycle mm -hmm. where we start cutting we realize that mm -hmm. the cuts don't save any money <laughs> literally don't save any money um mm -hmm. And then we and then we go back round again. And I've seen that cycle two or three times in my career, and it, mm. I find it um, I find it uh, intellectually stimulating, but emotionally draining actually, mm. um, because I'm very committed to the people at the sharp end of the inverse care law. It's where I'm from. You know, I grew up in Wakefield, mm. and I think we we've yet to to 
politically in this country get a kind of settlement that that acknowledges that these services the sort of services that turning point offered and that the nhs offer are kind of they're the they're the trunk of the tree and if we start cutting them and chunking them, we don't get any branches and we don't get any leaves and we don't get a forest you know we're in deep trouble <laughs> but it yeah. seems that we don't that there's a political successive prime ministers eyes you know light up for a few minutes and then glaze over when you start talking about social policy and mm. it's deeply it, it's not it's not edifying i think in in terms of political leadership because people people suffer and what I experienced in 20, nearly 20 years was the truth in the statement that without vision, people die. Mm. And that's what I witnessed, the lack of vision mm. for the future of public services. Um, mm. And because of that, people die. What's your assessment of the way in which public services have had to cope with COVID uh, up until this point now and uh, as we look forward? Well, they've borne the brunt of it, haven't they? Yeah. You know, I mean, the first 10 people to die in the NHS were, were all black. Uh, the NHS um, bore the brunt, but then so did local government, um, just as, you know, and, and, you know, because it's, we suddenly realised that people rely on the connectivity provided by public services. Actually, you know, the pubs might close, but if you don't get your dustbins emptied, your right. doctor's surgery closes, your hospital can't function. Mm. You, you you know you you're in real trouble. <laughs> you can't get to the supermarket. The the so what I witness is you know we are being held together by our public services. No question about that. Mm. Um, and um, we, when we when we withdrew funding from public services, we withdrew some of the things that we now desperately need. I mean, some of the cuts to public health, for instance. And you know we're now ruining the day. We did we did we did that because so. I think we're realising, hopefully realising, that public services aren't just for the good times, a bit like the dog, not just for Christmas, but also for the bad times. And every time you cut them, you cut in the ability of society to be resilient when those bad times come, as they inevitably will. What I will say is, is that the I am staggered um, and impressed and deeply moved by the passion and the just the resilience of the front line. And, and I say that, not by means of the sort of applause every Thursday or turning them into heroes, because you know what, they're not. They're just human beings who get up every day and do what they can. And we should pay them for that and we should respect them for it. And we shouldn't diss them by pretending that they're anything other than human. Mm -hmm. But it is amazing. And they're holding the country together. Local government, health service, social care, holding the country together in spite of the most horrific circumstances. Nearly 50,000 people have died in this country um and they take a lot of those people take risks with their life and their lives with their family every day so mm. it, it's pretty awe-inspiring actually and speaks and speaks huge volumes for the values of this country i think you're right and when i think about your experience and your visionary leadership on social enterprise and engagement in the public sector in particular What's your sense of the extent to which social enterprise could possibly play a larger part in the National Health Service and the provision of these sorts of areas for our nation? Yeah, well, it already does. You know, 30% of all community services are delivered by social enterprises. Um, uh, well over half of all substance misuse services delivered by either social enterprises or the charitable sector under contract. Now, let me tell you, you know, if I closed... If, if, if the current chief executive turning point closed turning point on the Monday, you would notice the difference in our major cities by Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> this is, you know, I can tell you that without a hint of irony. Um, so we're already providing, I think what we need is the recognition for that in the delivery and development of public policy. Mm -hmm. I think that social enterprises are at the bedrock. Uh, I mean, just, just look at what, what we, social enterprises produce more for um, the Great Britain PLC than agriculture and entertainment business put together. <laughs> Our biggest um, social enterprises in this country contribute more tax than, uh, than, than Google, Facebook, Apple put together. Now that says something about how we tax those companies 
but it, yeah. said, so it said something about the size of so we misunderstand the size of the social enterprise economy in this country uh -huh. we don't recognize it i think it's it's the gift that keeps on giving uh -huh. <laughs> um uh -huh. despite the fact that um, political leaders of all parties actually have not uh -huh. recognized or misunderstood the, the 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 power within social enterprise we operate in the most deprived areas um, mm -hmm. we, we're more likely to have leaders that are women or black people with the mm -hmm. fastest growing form of business in the country. We're more mm -hmm. sustainable all round than any other form of business. It's, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it is frustrating that, um, that the both Labour Party and the Conservatives haven't grasped the potential of social enterprise to be the bedrock of the recovery from mm -hmm. the COVID, coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and engineered policies to support that. It's a, it's a real shame. That's very interesting. And thinking about the future and the future of policy, and of course, Keir Starmer has become leader of the Labour Party yeah. and has a new shadow front bench team now. What kind of messages do you have for him and his team? What do they need to be thinking about now, early? in their policy mm. development leading up to the next mm. election in the next four years? Well, l l learn from the fact past and be bold about the future. That's what I'd say. I mean, this is the, the COVID and the recovery and the current state of British politics, I think calls for a bold vision. Um, and I don't mean a vision rooted in an old fashioned view of what, you know, the Labour Party was in 1938 or 48 or 58. Mm. Nobody's interested. <laughs> To be honest, I'm interested in the future. What is the future vision for this country that builds on what we know and what we can do and actually on the strength of our young people and their energy as well as the likes of me? And there are certain clues that just stay you in the face. And social enterprise is one of them. It's like, you know, it's not, you know, it's it's there. It's not as though it's a new idea that you have to sort of bring people to because it's never been done before it was invented in this country it's successful in this country and it needs to be supported in this country uh, because it could be the and and to commerce but also in public services you know the the, the fact of the matter is social enterprises are holding up the nhs and a lot of the work that they do in communities mm -hmm. if they stop doing it would literally crippled the nhs in terms of demand um, from just community services alone mm -hmm. so we shouldn't we need to stop you know the seuk often is often fighting and lobbying and campaigning mm -hmm. what we need to be doing is actually working with the labor party um mm -hmm. the party of government if it you know gets there on a platform that enables them to hit the ground running and support what's already there build it and increase its potency to change the country's fortunes going forward. And I think that it'd be a real shame if we can't, if we can't do that because we're too frightened to change. Very um, because the change is coming, whether we like it or not, it's on us. That's true. And obviously the aging demographic is another big factor mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. the need for provision of wider care services in uh, successful retirement for people. What's your sense yeah. of that particular aspect? Well, I think, I can't understand. This is something which um, the, the the problem, the, the the care crisis, and it is a care crisis, has been going on for too long. And when something is going on, has been going on for so long, I stop asking the question, "How can we fix it?" And I start asking the question, "Why we haven't fixed it? <laughs> what is it about social care that means that successive governments have failed to put in a proper settlement?" When the NHS was first devised um, in Tredegar, it wasn't just, it wasn't a hospital system. It was a hospital and care system. <laughs> it was free at the point of access. Mm -hmm. I cannot understand why in the sixth richest country in the world, we haven't devised a system where people can be secure in their old age. It seems to me to be absolutely obvious that that's what we need to do. Because if we don't do it, the, the the health system collapses <laughs> it's the part of anything else uh, and it's moral and it makes no moral or economic sense so uh, there's been the bill not inquiry made very good recommendations about how we use personal assets taxation to create a, a stable um, infrastructure for social care 
I don't see why that's an out, such an outrageous thing. I think we need a health and care system. Um, we the treasury is we need one budget for health and care. We need a single um, policy for health care, um, for health and care, and we and we need to fund it properly. And the idea that you can pass off social care into some kind of never never land and hope it goes away and that families will look after their own. Well, we can see it's for the birds. We've seen coronavirus has shown us how cruel that is actually and how inefficient it is in terms of the use of public money so you know it, it, it's 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 low-hanging fruit uh, that needs to be fixed and maybe i'm not a politician enough to understand why it hasn't been fixed but it's a question i ask as a taxpayer because mm. it's wrong it's not a good use of my tax mm. to have it in the state that it's in mm. that makes sense and and finally if i ask you this um what would you say to young people who are attracted to the idea of doing something as, an, as a not-for-profit, as a social enterprise, as a business which has a social purpose, good social impact? What, what advice would you give them now in thinking about their futures and their job satisfaction yeah. in a good organisation? Well, well, to be honest with you, I don't have to give them any advice at all because you people are searching for social enterprises in their droves. I mean, I happen to be on the board of the co-op group and I can tell you now, young people know who the man is. They don't want to go and work for some company that's going to make their environment um, poisonous. They don't, they don't want to work. The, the reasons why young people... I, I once went to a university careers uh, option, right? To tell you, and it was one of the red brick universities. I won't tell you which one, but it was very, very you know, famous. Um, um, and I won't mention the name Oxford. But, but they, they, you know, they, they, we had a load of people in the room and the careers person said to me look you're going to talk about social enterprise you might not get many people because down the road the milk round is picking them up for um mckinsey's and pwc and da, 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 da. i turned up the room was jam-packed standing room only couldn't get them in right and i talked about you know what else are you going to do with your life do you want to leave the world better than you found it or do you just want to make a few bob you know everybody they all wanted to leave the world but they all wanted to deal with the issues and these were students labor conservative lib dem i asked them that it was they, they wanted to add value right and at the end i'll never forget it there was a few of them looking dumbfounded and upset and one there's one woman in tears and because she just signed a contract to go and work for some bank somewhere and she she you know she was and she didn't know she didn't know there was an option to, mm -hmm. to have a career you mm -hmm. know in the not for dividend sector as i prefer to call it because i don't know an organization on god's good green earth that doesn't have to make a profit right in mm -hmm. the charity sector they call it a surplus i think you should call it a profit um, mm -hmm. it's what you do with it that matters um and you know she 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 was in bits so <laughs> i think if you tell young people about it they want to do it and and now because of the state of the environment and what's happening with covid and the economy I tell you, young people are looking very carefully at where they spend their early, their life, their career. A social enterprise doesn't have any trouble attracting them. They're, they're, they're rushing to us. I'd be more concerned about other forms of business um, uh, where they're having to use some slightly underhand tricks to get people in, um, to get young people in. Uh, once they're in, <laughs> they've sold their soul kind of thing. But the young people, in my experience, look for meaning. Mm. They look for meaning in the work they do. Well, we certainly found lots of meaning this afternoon in this interview. Thank you so much for your time Thank today. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Good it's been great. Good luck with COVID, and uh, I'll you. come back to you soon for an update as, uh, as soon as you're free. Cheers. Please do. It'll be a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.